This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Welcome, everybody, to a special trade deadline podcast. My man, Vito, what's happening? I'm good. How about yourself, John? Dude, what a great Sunday. The Tigers won in an epic fashion. Great start for Mike Pelfrey. He must have been, up, you know, he must have been so excited to come out to a 6 nothing lead. Unbelievable day. I spent the day myself at the beach, on the water, you know, Nothing could be better for me. I'm having a good old time. The phone lines are open. I'm going to chat baseball with you. We're going to have a couple great guests on this fine podcast. What made you want to do a trade deadline podcast, man? Well, it's a trade deadline. Come on. The trade deadline chatter is so rapid. I love keeping up with it. It gets me going on a Monday morning. So I'm always pumped up around trade deadline season. It is the deadline, not a waiver deadline. Tomorrow at 4 p.m. Usually it's July 31st, so it will be August 1st. This year, because July 31st fell on a Sunday, so love talking baseball, obviously, all the time we do so on Tiger's Sun, but trade deadline talk is so intriguing with all the rumors circulating about the Tigers and all these other Major League Baseball clubs, too, makes it really interesting to talk about, John, to say the least. No kidding. Now, the best part is with this project is we don't have to be in the same studios. You're out there in Clinton Township. I'm out here in Macomb. We can rap baseball, take phone calls. What a great idea. I'm very excited that you're passionate about baseball. And, hey, I want to give you credit. I've been a guy that's been up and down like a roller coaster fan, and I'm happy with how I how I look at the Tigers. But you've been the one steadying force along with Adam that has said, listen, Baseball is a 162-game grind, and there are going to be moments when the Tigers are going to play well. And my goodness, Vito, a sweep of the Houston Astros, great comeback on on Saturday, followed by a mashing on Sunday. The Tigers look to be, you know, kicking it into gear on all cylinders. A great weekend of baseball, and uh, our own Jenna Jenna Jones was at the ballpark today. Yeah, it was great to see. I saw some pictures from her on Twitter, and. What an enjoyable day huh? at the ballpark. Great weather, not too hot. All the runs being scored in the first, adding six runs. A grand slam hit by James McCann, who's coming out of late. I honestly thought they should trade him for Jonathan Lucroy. Well, at this point, uh, no way, oh, they, they're keeping McCann. He's a youngster, great arm. You know, they don't call him McCannon for just any reason. Now, maybe Brian McCann already has that nickname and moniker in his favor. Uh, but he didn't copyright it, so James McCann has it rightfully. So, better throwing out of base dealers is he than Brian McCannon. I love James McCann right now. He got it done today and Saturday, the ninth inning. Tigers have lost over JV, struggled in the ninth, but the Tigers came back, won it in the bottom of the ninth, and that was the second game of the series, and then they swept the series by winning Sunday. And in blowout fashion, it was never close. Dallas Cycle got bombed from the start, and everybody contributed. Miguel Cabrera, two home runs. I believe he passed Mickey Mantle, the great Yankees Hall of Famer, on the all-time RBI list in Major League Baseball history. So, Maybe doing big things. Hey, heating up at the right time, obviously, too. Upton maybe is heating up. McCann is heating up. Iglesias is looking really solid. Beat up that, that ground out single to get the game-winning run Saturday for JV and the Tigers. So I love what they're doing right now. You know, I might not have been the most optimistic to all admit going into the Astros series. And I thought they could win two out of three at least against the Bo Sox. They swept the Bo Sox, have swept the Astros now, winners of their last six and eight of their last ten. And honestly, they could be winners of their last ten. They blew two games against the White Sox last weekend, John, as you know. Now listen, Vito, what are you doing out there? Because you keep dialing your button there. I can hear it over the phone. Am I dialing something? Yes, I can ah, hear No, no, no. I'm not trying to. You know, I'm on my phone. I'm looking at my phone. Yeah, I've got notes on here, too, to keep track of what I'm talking about. I want to sound educated. But actually, I do know, well, really everything on here. But I like having this as a secondary source. So maybe you're hearing me go through my phone. It could be that, Doc. I'll admit that. I don't know what else. I'll <laughs> say that. It might okay. be me just going through my notepad. Yeah, if, yeah. If, anyways. If it happens again, I'm going to drop you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Chop me permanently, right? Okay, so Vito. Network. So Vito. How many choices do I already have against? I already have a few. Anyways, go on. Yeah, so Vito, this morning started out a little bit shaky. I was a little bit nervous because the news came out that the Indians kind of muscled up and were in talks to get Andrew Miller and Jonathan Lacroix from from uh, Milwaukee. Andrew Miller's deal came through. He's been acquired by the Indians, and it's already been noted he's going to be the closer. But LaCroix, very interestingly, exercised his no-trade clause. One of the teams that was on there was the Cleveland Indians. And so when the news came out that potentially the Indians got LaCroix and Andrew Miller, everyone kind of panicked a little bit going, oh, boy, should the Tigers answer? What are they going to do? The Indians are now the team to beat. But... I'm a little bit happy that LaCroix exercised this option. Are you hearing any news as to why he did this? But uh, the move he to... Actually, you the, know what? Listen, Vito, the move to gain so Andrew Miller is a good one. Absolutely. Great late inning arm. Throw some heat out of the Indians. Pen and a great, you know, guy. It can be a closer. It can be a cheap inning guy. Closer. And will be the closer. Now, Cody Allen is not consistently productive and or dominant as a ninth inning guy. So Miller... Fulfills that role now, should be more efficient in that closer role than Cody Allen, too. So, like the upgrade there for the Indians at the back end of the pen. And losing out on Luke, love it as a Tigers fan. And, you know, it stinks for the Indians, though. They're going for it. And that win now, well, they want to win the World Series after the Cleveland Cavaliers won the NBA title and all this title drought in Cleveland, and now the Indians have a chance, but they get burned by Jonathan Lucroy, a two-time All-Star, All-Star this year as a catcher for the Milwaukee Brewers. And he used what I like to call, everybody well knows about, and it's his veto power. I like to call it that. Love that veto power. He utilized it fully at the right time, using it and refusing to wave his no-trade clause to the Indians. So if he was going to use his veto power, that is a team to do it, too, and I'm glad he did. Even though I heard he might have done the same to the Tigers. And it was funny, I saw people on Twitter reacting to it, too, and saying kind of my same mentality regarding it, that the Tigers aren't the 0-1 Tigers anymore. So why would he have a no-trade clause to the Tigers? I could see him having a no-trade clause to the Indians now because of prior seasons, not getting over the hump there in Cleveland, not winning division titles. But Tigers have been a playoff team. Outside of last year, they won four straight division titles, 2011 to 2014. So was it just based off of last year, Luke Roy, you know, vetoing or wanting to veto then a potential deal to the Tigers? And... To answer your question now, John, I heard that he vetoed that deal to the Indians because of the fact that he was going to be a platoon guy next year at the catcher position. They were going to kind of work him around at DH and at first base with Luke Roy, and he wants to be the full-time starting catcher. And he should. He deserved that that starting gig full-time because he's been an all-star. Jan Gomes has not been, and that's the guy they have fulfilling that role uh, behind the plate next season in Cleveland. So because of that conflict there, Jonathan Luca decided to utilize his veto power, and I think he was wise in doing so. Obviously, the Tigers fan, but also because that was a stupid response by the Indians telling him that. If you're going to do that to somebody who you're trading for, well, that guy deserves to utilize his veto power, in my opinion, Doc. No, I, I agree. You know what? One, you know, I think a lot of media jumped the gun and said that it already happened. And, and then as the day progressed, it kind of got, you know, the rumor speculated that the deal was falling through because the Indians had to give up so much, I believe, four strong prospects to the Yankees. And so the deal fell apart, and the Indians have muscled up. It's a good move. They're making, you know, by all accounts, what they're trying to do is go all in, try their absolute best to make a run because when you look at that ball club, strong hitting, starting rotation that's decent, you need it to kind of address some concerns for the bullpen, and they did that with Andrew Miller. But now you got to look at it and you start the comparisons in that without Andrew Miller, the Indians have had great success against the Tigers. Do you think now with this move – that they're leaps and bounds ahead of the Tigers, and the only goal they have right now is to reach the wild card? Well, right, you know what, in baseball, and right now going forward, same scenario presents itself. It is that baseball is a beautiful game and that it's based on a lot of luck and who's playing well at the right time going into a series against one another. And the Tigers right now, how they're hitting, how they're playing overall-wise, they would do well against anybody, in my opinion. Now, they might lose to the White Sox now in this upcoming series because they lose against the bad teams and beat up on the good teams outside of the Indians. But I don't think it really puts the Indians head and shoulders above the Tigers. They are already better, are still better, but are they head and shoulders above the Tigers in talent level? I would say no, Doc. I think the Indians are better, more of a threat to win the division, and that's why they have the lead over the Tigers and have done so well against the Tigers to this point. 
Well, the Tigers being 1-11 in 11 and 12 games against the Indians up to this point is not just because of the talent level being that big in the favor of the Indians. I don't think the, the gap is that wide in talent. I think it's more of a luck, too, and the Indians have been more lucky. But the Tigers heating up at the right time going into August before the trade deadline. I think they're going to have luck more on their side, and they can ride that luck and that talent level to, I think, be able to beat the Indians more often. And maybe that'll only be three, four times the rest of the way this season, Doc. But it's still something... And it's something a lot better than what they did in the first half, I guess, to try. Yeah, no, it was um, something now when the Tigers match up versus the Indians in the seven games that they're going to play the rest of the way. It's going to be very exciting. But now let's talk a little bit about the Detroit Tigers and the moves that they're going to make. Do you believe that the basically what Alavila said last week in that if they're going to make a move, then they're about to basically only get – Maybe a fourth or fifth starter, a guy that's not going to be too sexy? Yeah, they're not going with the sexy arms because I don't think they have the talent level to give up in the farm system or the guys they want or, you know, desire to give up on the major league roster or in the farm system. So that means you have to go for lesser options, such as a fourth, fifth starter. Uh, Jeremy Hellickson, maybe even 36-year-old Rich Hill. Guys like that. I saw Wade Miley was just dealt. He's off the table now for the Tigers in pursuit of fourth and fifth starter uh, types. So, I like how listen, I, I see him being a candidate to be dealt for. I see Drew Smiley as a candidate. I see Irvin Santana, Edison Volquez, the Royals, if they're willing to deal him. Uh, I see a team that's not from the division dealing with the Tigers more likely. So that would mean the Rays, maybe even Jake Odorizzi, who is more of a third starter type, has been really good his last two outings. I would love getting him. But what is the asking price? Apparently they're not willing to give up Daniel Norris, not willing to give up Matt Boyd, those two left-handers. So that means, while what is left to give up, that teams want to attain from the Tigers in a deal for a guy such as Jake Odorizzi? Well, I don't know. That's a big question mark, and maybe they have to give up Joe Jimenez. Are they willing to give him up, though? And I don't think the Tigers want to have to part with a big group of prospects from their farm system. So that doesn't lead to any more options out there, you know, to entertain on the open market going into the deadline at 4 p.m. So I think it will be a non-sexy option. It will be a guy like Drew Smiley and Urban Santana. Uh, and I think best-case scenario, they get a guy like Jake Odorizzi of the Rays stock. Well, Vito, a couple weeks back, I had the privilege of listening to you on the Podcast Ianos podcast, you know, a podcast that's really good, dedicated to the Detroit Tigers, and uh, you did a great job, Vito. And we're lucky now to um, punch up Jordan Hall. You can find him on Twitter at JordanHall23. You can find the Podcast Ianos podcast on iTunes and where podcasts are found. He's on the line probably looking as excited as we are to see what the Tigers are going to do. Jordan, good evening. What's happening? Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Good to be on. No problem, man. Welcome. And uh, how exciting this last week for the Detroit Tigers, one that uh, I know a lot of people have said it's a long season, but hey, it's nice to see the Tigers punch up some runs and beat up some people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, they talk about baseball being a marathon, not a sprint, but like, you know, somewhere along the way, you got to enjoy the the miles and not just you know try and get to 26. This has been a week to uh, to really enjoy. Um, we played well, we scored timely runs. Yeah, this has been has been a week to remember. That's for sure. And now, Jordan, the Tigers are doing so well right now. They're buyers, but maybe not big time buyers in terms of getting top tier talent. So, what do you see them being able to attain? That is a really interesting question. I think a lot of that depends on what the MRI on Mike Pelfrey's uh, step back comes back with. Um, if he's if he's good to go, and I don't, I don't know if there's any way they're going to be able to tell that between now and 4 p.m., but if he's good to go, I really don't see them making too awfully much of a, of, of a move. Um, if he's not going to be able to contribute for a couple weeks, then I think your hand is forced and you have to go get a Jeremy Hellickson Rich Hill doesn't make a ton of sense because he's still on the disabled list. Um, maybe a Volquez. Uh, I'm trying to think of someone else kind of in that range just to to give you uh, a, a bridge to when he can come back. You know, he had a, an, an incredible start for him today, and it's really such a, a terrible shame that he's he's going on, you know, with an injury now. Um, but I, I feel like people have played down the option of, of going big and – you know, I'm not. I'm not saying that I think that they're going to, but I think there's a non-zero chance that they take a swing for the fences, especially having seen what Cleveland, you know, did and tried to do yesterday. You know, I don't know what arm. Maybe it's Archer. Maybe they. Maybe they mortgage the the future and really go for it. Um, you know, we we talked last week on the show about the two-year plan with the Upton signing, with re-signing JD for two years, Avila, Pelfrey, like all these guys are, are on two-year deals. You know, there's not, not a ton of time left. 
maybe, may you know, I feel like we haven't, you haven't seen the narrative of bye, 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 at least in, in the Detroit media. But, um, you know, Dombrowski did a lot of stuff under the radar, and we haven't seen exactly how Avila operates. And I, I think it'll be really interesting um, to see if maybe, maybe he's had something under wraps. Or, or is working on something as we speak. Maybe he is. I think we're all hoping for that to be the case, going out to get Chris Archer. thing is, do they have enough pieces in the farm to get Chris Archer from the race? Well, I don't know that we have enough uh, pieces in the farm, but I think that there are enough pieces total. Um, if you throw someone like Norris back their way, um, that would obviously be a, a good start. And, I mean, you would, you would have to give up something significant, and we don't necessarily have something significant down on the farm. Um, but I mean, there are pieces to be rearranged if you wanted to use, you know, an outfielder and, and Norris to, to really go, go after it. And Jordan, you know, as you said about Rich Hill on the DL, he's 36, forget about him. Really, he's a stinky possibility and not a real possibility now, which is probably a good thing for the Tigers. They're not going down that route then with that being Mm -hmm. said. So, uh, he would have been maybe a quality number three R, but another guy who's younger, better value, uh, that he would provide. And that would be the race starting pitcher, Jake owner Rizzi. Now, what do you think of him maybe coming over to the Tigers from the race? We talked about the Archer possibility, but how about Oda Rizzi coming to the Tigers? I, I like Oda Rizzi. Um, I, I don't know that he's a significant upgrade on, on Norris long-term. I think he's better than him right now, which, like we said, or I said, um, you know, it's kind of a two-year window that we're looking at right now. Um, so if, it, it, all, it all depends on cost. If he's going to cost Norris or Boyd or you know, some combination of one of the two of them and Jimenez. Um, I, I, I don't see that them I don't see them going for it. Um, but if they can if they can snag him with Boyd and maybe um, you know a, a Stewart or, or a mid level prospect like that, I, I could see that happening. Um, he, he is a good pitcher. I, I haven't had a chance to watch him extensively. I don't think that he has you know he doesn't have stuff uh, ace stuff, um, and, and he's not necessarily super young to the point where he could develop into a stuff. Um, but he, he could definitely be serviceable, which, you know, considering the top half of the rotation we have, you know, serviceable will do the trick, really. He'd be a great number four, you know, yeah, behind yep. J.D. Fulmer, behind Jordan Zimmerman. So they would slot him perfectly there, better than I think any other option out there that the Tigers uh, can get at this point. So now let me ask you, you know, we talked about Daniel Norris, Matt Boyd. You brought up those two guys specifically being in deals. Now, the rumor right now circulating around the Twitter sphere, let's call it, is that those guys aren't available in deals. Do you believe in that? Are you drinking the Kool-Aid over those guys not uh, being available? When you were on my show, we talked about Matt Boyd quite a bit. I, I love Matt Boyd. I think he's a, he's a grinder. But I just don't see him having sustained major league success in the rotation. If somebody wants him, with all due respect to Matt, I'm probably letting him go. Norris is a little bit different. Um, Norris is coming off a season, or excuse me, an off season of, of tribulation. You know, he had the the cancer incident. There was an injury. I, I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. And for a young kid like that to lose essentially his entire off season of development is tough. I don't know if he's going to, you know, recover in time this year to be a contributor. Uh, but there's kind of no reason to long term give up on him just because this year hasn't exactly. Uh, panned out as we wanted. And an interesting tidbit with Norris that Robert Jackie actually brought up last week is that his innings have been really limited this year. When he comes back from the DL, he's going to be more fresh than a lot of pitchers at this point, just because he hasn't thrown all that many innings so far with, with the various injuries, which is kind of an interesting way of looking at it. Jordan Hall, Podcast Yano's on the line with us. Now, Obviously, the Tigers can't probably make the big moves like to get a Chris Sale or other players of that like because of what they have in the minors. But can you speak on who are the high, highly rated prospects right now in the minors that could potentially be included in some deals? Well, we have Stewart, who I believe is in one of one of the various A-ball levels. He's a big power hitter. To be honest, I, I mean, I, I haven't seen him with my own eyes, but the scouting reports that I've seen – <laughs> the comparison um, is maybe a slightly more uh, disciplined Stephen Moya, which, you know, if, if Stephen Moya could become, you know, a, an adequate outfielder, you have a player there. Um, big Anyway, with Stewart, big time pop. Sounds like he's a corner outfielder, probably a right fielder. I'm trying to think of some of the the other ones. Um, you know, Joe Jimenez is, an, is another guy that, that everyone has heard of. Um, Jacoby Jones plays uh, center field for us down in Toledo. I, I don't know what his trade value is at this point. He hasn't exactly lit the world on, on fire, 
at AAA, and he is 25. Um, there's there's a lot of reasons to to get excited about him, and he's the, he's the guy that came over in the Soria deal from last year. And I still think that there's a small trade uh, value with Stephen Moya. I don't know that he's ever going to develop into a guy that can play regularly, at least in the field. Um, but there's a, there's a market out there for guys who can hit home runs, especially left-handers off the bench. And I think that the right team could see him as a piece that they can use in a specific way to get a lot out of them. And to be honest, I see the Rays as a team that might, you know, might see that in him because they find guys that other teams, I wouldn't say cast aside, but haven't found the right use for. And they plug him into, into spots that they, they need to fill, like, you know, Steve Pierce and Steven Souza, two guys that they've gotten recently um, that weren't super on everyone's radar and have played pretty decently for them. Hey, guys, let's turn our attention now to the upcoming series with the Tigers against the White Sox. Start on Tuesday night. We have James Shields thrown for the Chai Sox against Anibal Sanchez on the Tigers. He's been dismal. We all know about the struggles of him all season long, no longer the Sanchez. And just to sum it up, I don't like him. Should be cut, I think. And the intriguing storyline regarding these two going head-to-head Tuesday night is that these guys maybe won't even be starting in that game. I mean, if you look at it this way, James Shields could be dealt by the White Sox still. And if the Tigers acquire an arm such as Jake Odorizzi or Jeremy Hellickson, you got to believe that Anibal Sanchez is unlikely to be DFA. I mean, that could happen. Now, I'm going to say under 50% of the chances of that happening. But I'm going to put you, Jordy, now in the hot seat here. What do you think? Over or under 50% of the chances of those guys not even going head-to-head on Tuesday night? I, I really can't speak to Shields. Um, I haven't I haven't stayed up on the White Sox, but I think there's a 100% chance that Anna Ball starts for us, which is the most unfortunate thing in the world. Um, I don't <laughs> I don't think he's going anywhere, even if we um, even if we do trade for someone. I would assume if we if we get an arm, he'll go back to the bullpen, and this is probably where you'll see either Logue at DFA or Dustin Mulligan go back down to AAA. There's just so much money attached to Andy Ball. I don't think that he can be DFA'd as much as we all would like it. And, you know, I I love Annabelle. Annabelle gave us some great years, but it just just isn't happening for him. And where his stuff is at, it's just not going to happen for him. You know, if if he can give us some innings and long relief, then at least we're getting something out of all of that money. Um, But, you know, every time we run him out there as a starter, you know, not to be rude, but we're essentially just calling it for the night. Yeah, he's been stinky and does not give the Tigers a huge advantage in any match as of right now when he does start, but does bring some value, I think, as a long reliever out of the pen. So we'll see what happens there mm-hmm. with the Sanchez of past. If you're not the Sanchez. So Anibal Sanchez, I think, will go Tuesday, too, as of right now. And hopefully not that much more, though, after that. But anyways, wanted to ask you now really quick before we let you go here uh, about the chances now the Tigers making a deal. Are those chances over or under 50%, Jordan? Who? That's a tough one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say under. I, I, if I were to have to wager, I would say that they don't make a move. But I, I kind of hope they do. Um, it, it would be a nice sign of, of intention that we're, that we're going for it. Um, but I posted on Twitter this morning that I, I don't want them to make a move just to make a move, you know, based on what Cleveland's been trying to do. That's how you set yourself back. That's how you do something, um, <laughs> do something stupid that we'll be regretting for years. Like, if there's somebody that a will – sees and says, you know what, this guy can help us. I want him to go out and get him, but I don't want him to just, you know, call up, you know, an agent and be like, all right, who's, who's available and then pick the biggest name. Um, and not saying he would, but I know there, there are GMs out there that kind of have that, that MO. Um, but yeah, I, I don't see it happening, but it would be, it'd be a nice uh, Monday afternoon surprise if, if something did. Jordan Hall, thank you very much for all your time today on this special edition of Tigers Talk. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. You have a good one. You too. Very interesting stuff, Vito. Uh, Jordan Hall, you can find his podcast on iTunes, Podcastianos. You were on there. There, Jordan Hall was gracious enough to extend you an invite when one of the co-hosts was no longer around. Well, you heard it, Vito. He thinks less than 50% chance. I think a lot of people thought once, uh, once they saw what Cleveland did that it was time for the Tigers to keep up with the Joneses. Do you think that what Cleveland did is going to affect what Alavila has set, or do you think that, you know what, they're going to stay the course, and this week could be actually a very interesting week in the history of the Tigers organization because right now a week like this would lead management probably to believe that they should just stand pat. I mean, you've dominated some teams. You're going to get some guys back. And so it's very interesting what, uh, what's gone on now with the Tigers this week for sure and juxtapose that with what Cleveland did. 
the Tigers, I believe, are set in their ways right now, Doc. So I don't see them going out to get a big, a big item, a big name commodity. But I think they'll still entertain offers up until 4 p.m. the non-waiver deadline, and I think it could be a guy that is a third starter that they end up getting because I still believe that because they're in the win-now mode, they know they have to upgrade if the right guy is out there for the right price. So I believe if the price tag is right, they will go out and get a starting arm, such as a Jake Odorizzi, who would be a nice addition to the Tigers' middle of the rotation. I don't think the Indians do what they have getting Andrew Miller, almost getting Jonathan Lucroy makes the Tigers want to go out and, and make a move even more than before. I think there's still the intent is more to stand pat than overpaying to get a guy that will upgrade the rotation or maybe another another area of need on the Tigers roster as it stands right now, Doc. Mm, okay. See, this week was very interesting in terms of the Tigers. Do you feel like we should give Brad Ausmus more credit because something has happened, whether it be more excitement in the clubhouse? Don't you get a sense that the Tigers as a unit, are playing a lot better, a lot harder. And you, you, can, you can sense that in a game like Saturday where they, you know, give up a lead late. You know, Justin Verlander, whether you believed or not that he should have came out for the ninth, he came out and he surrendered uh, two runs and the Tigers came back late with two outs in the bottom of the ninth inning. And there's just a different vibe this week, kind of getting a sense that the players are going all out. Do you think that uh, as much... As we blame Brad Osmus, that we need to kind of maybe look to what he's done, maybe to kind of infuse the, this organization or to keep these guys together because this week they seem to be going balls to the wall. But wasn't Saturday night the easy decision to make in keeping Verlander out there for the ninth inning at what, 97, 98 pitches? If he's under 100 and pitching as well as he was going into the ninth, you keep him out there. That's an easy decision for any skipper out there who has no experience even. So I say, what does that mean for Brad Austin? I think nothing. I don't give him any credit for that decision. I think it was just a common sensible decision that you have to make in his position, Doc. So I'm not going to give him a ton of credit. I think the team just wants to win and should want to win no matter who their skipper is. They should not be getting up on the season. And they see the writing on the wall. This team's window opportunity to win and win titles is closing and closing rapidly with really a two-year window after they got up in on the opt-out clause after two years, so after next season, as Jordan was explaining. So I think right now they have this two-year window widely open, but after next year, things could change and could change quickly. So they better try to win this year, regardless of who their skipper is. So I don't think Osmus is totally motivating the troops to the point where they're playing for him, for his job security. I think it's more about they're playing for their own paychecks, right, for their own job security. And I think they should be doing that, regardless of who their skipper is, Doc. Okay, yeah, no, because it also goes that we saw the video where Ian Kinsler and Jose Iglesias were having fun playing rock, paper, scissors. It seems like they're having a lot more fun. And once a ball, you know what, breeds fun, winning, and having a week like this definitely kind of eases the tension and makes these ball players play a lot better and more relaxed. And, you know, I really believe that a, a sweep versus Boston, a sweep versus Houston, looking ahead to the White Sox, the Tigers are looking at the schedule going, you know what, this is the time to put it into gear. And uh, it's making the decision a lot harder because had they maybe lost a lot of games this week or had they just gone 500, maybe the organization would have added more. Now that you see this Tigers team winning, you see what the organization is seeing. You see that, okay, this team, if it gets hot at the right time, could do some damage. The problem is, though, this team hasn't done it quite enough for me to say, okay, stand pat. So I would say this team, this group of guys with this talent, probably has a ceiling of maybe the wild card or maybe getting to a round or two. But let's look at the big picture, Vito. When you have a $200 million payroll, the goal should be and the question should be, can this team, as constructed, without making moves, win the World Series? I would say no. I would say Cleveland has made the job much harder. And when you look at, they've gone out and added a closer, not only for this year, but they're going to have control of them for the foreseeable future. It would have been interesting had LaCroix accepted the deal. But Cleveland is starting to put together a roster that, uh-oh, if the Tigers don't make a run this year, it's going to be harder for them to rebuild and overcome Cleveland because they're building a young group, a, a solid nucleus right now. They're the favorites right now, in my opinion, to win the American League because of the strength of their starting rotation, what they've added in Andrew Miller for the back end of the pen, and a young core amongst their hitters. So they are a better team than the Tigers, and they are the favorites, rightfully so, I think, in the AL right now. 
But the Tigers are coming up at the right time, have the ability, have the talent level on their team as a whole. And if they make that one move to kind of put them over the hump, they could even get into the division lead in the AL Central, in my opinion, because the Indians are still faulty. They have their weaknesses. They're not a complete team, and no team in the AL is. The Blue Jays aren't, the Orioles aren't, the Red Sox aren't, the Tigers aren't, and the Indians certainly aren't. But are they the strongest all-around club? Yes, so they will be a mighty tough opponent to beat going forward, too. But the Tigers should play better should play better against the Tribe, and that's what I believe they will, because Tigers are, I think, coming into form more and more. Their hitters are doing better. Guys that were struggling. Cabbies playing like a Hall of Fame caliber cabbie right now. So you got him going. You got other guys going. And starting arms, Pelfrey's looks better of late, even. Uh, the bullpen is what it is. It's an improved bunch at the back end of the pen compared to last year. So I think the bullpen, as I continue to say on each edition of this podcast, will progressively get better, show signs of being better. And I think because of that, the Tigers can keep up with the Joneses, which are the Indians right now at the top of the AL Central. And because of that, I see the Tigers and Indians being neck and neck the rest of the way. And the Tigers, I could see catapulting the tribe, even though I think more realistic right now is the Tigers getting in as one of the two wild cards in the American League, as you were saying too, Doc. Yeah. Real quickly, before we get back to the Tigers, would you imagine for the first time in 27 seasons the Yankees have sold? I mean, literally in the last couple of weeks, they've traded off Araldis Chapman and Andrew Miller. And when you look at what they got back, they, they're poised to kind of have a nice rebuild. They're, they're going with prospects, which not a lot of clubs like to do because you're giving away known talent for guys that you're not sure what they're going to do. But highly ranked talent from the Cubs and the Indians. How surprising, how shocked were you that the Yankees actually sold and actually let go of Chapman and Miller? Not totally because they're not a title contender this season. So if they're building for championships, only con- are only concerned about winning championships, well, guess what? Then you retool for next season because this year you're not going to win a championship. So they sold off pieces, major league talent, and high-level talent at the back end of the bullpen in Araldis Chapman and Andrew Miller. Who well, I was more surprised about the Yankees dealing, but the group of prospects they got in return from the Indians made it worth it for the Yankees to deal Andrew Miller to the tribe. So I like what they did dealing Chapman first and foremost, too, and maybe still the biggest deadline deal thus far because of what they got. Maybe the future shortstop in Glaber Torres, a top shortstop prospect who might be moved over to second. I've heard rumblings about that. The Yankees might decide to move him to second base. But they have him, Sterling Castro, D.D. Greg Gores, all these young guys. And that's why the Yankees could be a scary opponent for the Tigers and other Major League Baseball clubs going forward. And as soon as next year, when they might once again almost be of the caliber of a title contender, Doc. Yeah, I was like, wow, when I was reading the report that the Yankees haven't sold in 27 seasons, it makes you go, okay, had the Tigers maybe not had the week that they had, what would they have done? Who would they have sold? Now you're in the category of of knowing that the Tigers are either going to stand pat or make a move for either a third, fourth, or fifth starter. And so this week has probably changed the organization's tenure, and it's going to be a very exciting Monday, you know, right around that trade deadline to see what's going to happen. And and I think everybody's right. I don't see big blockbuster moves happening. You know, I don't see a Jimenez moving. I don't see the guys like, um, you know, everyday starters being moved. But, yeah, maybe the prospects, some guys that you've drafted high in the organization in the last couple of years could be moved, and you could see something like that. But if, let's just say this, if one Detroit Tiger is going to be moved, who would be on the list to be the guy that's likely going to be gone from the Tigers? That boy. I'm going to say him. He's a young starting arm. You know, a decent back end of the rotation left-hander. Honestly, how good will he be? I don't envision him being a great top of the line rotation on one day. So he's a guy that you are willing then to deal, even though the Tigers have been adamant about not being willing to deal him or Daniel Norris. Well, Norris is a good guy for the future for the top of the rotation. Boyd is not. There's a huge gap in talent, in my opinion, between Boyd and Daniel Norris. So I would deal Matt Boyd for the right deal to get a guy such as Jake Odorizzi once again of the race, whose name has popped out there now on the Twitter sphere more and more as trade rumors have come in about the Tigers and what they plan on doing going into the non-waiver deadline, which I hope is fruitful for the Tigers in the form of them making at least one deal. I just want one deal. But the chances of that happening, I'm not going to put at highly above 50%. I think they're still below, I would say a shade below. Let's say at 45% Doc. Where do you put them right now? The Tigers' chances of making a deal by that non-waiver deadline. 
See, I believe it's going to be 75%, but I think the move is going to be a minor move, maybe just one minor league prospect for a third to fourth to fifth starter. Nothing that's going to probably be super sexy, but something that could help out. And so I think that's what's going to happen. I think that's the the organization's plan. Um, maybe they could have done more, but they just look, and a lot of people are saying, you know what, the Tigers just don't have enough in the minor league system. I mean, really, when you look at it, when you look at the Tigers' prospects in the minors, there aren't too many that are in the MLB top 100, at least not in the list that I looked at recently. And so you can't just say, hey, we want a Chris Sale. Hey, we want a Chris Archer. You're going to have to make an offer. And so when you look at what the Tigers have to offer, the first thing most clubs are going to ask for is Fulmer and Norris or maybe a Jimenez or maybe Jacoby Jones or maybe one of the high draft picks you know, in the organization in the last couple of years. So I don't think the Tigers right now are in the situation or in the position to make those kind of moves. So that's just what it is. But they, I think they could make, you know, a minor move if Matt Boyd. But what is Matt Boyd going to get you? I mean, this guy is a guy that doesn't look as of late to me as a guy that's going to be too consistent as a starter yet. I mean, he's a guy that's still developing, but what the Tigers need in a starter is a guy that's going to eat a bunch of innings. And right now, Matt Boyd is still in development, as well as Norris, and so I would just say let him continue to develop in, in the Tigers organization, and maybe you can get something for him next season. And so we'll see. I know you'll be you know, right by your phone. We'll be hot and heavy looking at the trade deadline moves. But I want to talk about a decision that was made and something that you talked about, and you said that it was a no-brainer for Brad Ausmus to leave in Justin Verlander. I threw out a question on our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast, and I said, hey, do you bring him out? It was about a 50-50 response you know, from our followers saying, yeah, you have to obviously bring him out, or no, save his arm. My thing would have been, and my vote would have been, bring your closer out, save Justin Verlander, and but I'm not heated either way. You obviously, you know, in hindsight, realize that, okay, at that point, Justin Verlander was around, you know, mid-90s in terms of the pitches that he's thrown, and he his stuff just wasn't there in the ninth inning, and he gave up those two runs. So you say, okay, you should have used K-Rod. But if, you know, K-Rod comes out and blows the save, then Osmus is going to face heat, you know, why would you take out your horse? But either way, it was kind of a no-win situation, like you said. But in that situation, I'm more conservative, and I say, you know what? You have a closer for a reason. K-Rod's the man. He should have been tapped for the job. But in the end, you made it a little bit more difficult than you needed to. But hey, they came back and won. But I wonder if Brad Ausmus will look to that in the future. But he said that, hey, Justin Verlander's the only guy in this rotation I would even consider doing that with at that position, but I would say, in my opinion, if I was the manager, I would have went to my closer. Just keep it formulaic at that point in time, and I think you would have got maybe uh, an easier result. I don't care, Doc. I just said it. I mean, come on, he's your horse. Maybe he's your ace, and I get it. He's the only guy that you would allow to go out there for the night in that situation. Former on an inning limit, especially going forward, having starts get uh, Jordan Zimmerman coming back from injury. Nobody else is really reliable enough to throw out there for the ninth inning, too, and you have a reliable closer right now, and K-Rod, a veteran closer, is getting it done pretty darn consistently, so you consider throwing him in there in that situation, but one run lead, I trust JV more than K-Rod still, Doc. Oh, so my goodness. I would well, Vita, look at look out it. there, and I trust it, and even though he blew it, I still think he made the right decision in putting JV out there instead of K-Rod. I think you're being very short-sighted, Vito. you got to remember, Justin Verlander's <laughs> not on a one-year deal for $10 million. This is a guy that's slated to cash in checks and a yearly salary of $28 million for multiple seasons plus. And if, by chance, if you make a postseason run, adding up these you know, pitch counts at this point in time with a guy in his 30s, you are basically, every time he goes out there, getting closer to him, you know, basically reaching that empty tank. And so I think he did his job. I think if you look long term and say, you know what, this guy should be between a 98 and a 105 pitch count from here on out. And hey, you say that a, you know, you say that Justin Verlander after pitching 90, you know, mid 90s. Uh, for the game into the ninth inning is better than K Rod. I have to disagree. K Rod's fresh. He's been, he's he's a guy that's you know been shown to do his job. That's his job. Close the game out. And I think he would have got the job done. Maybe made it interesting, but he would have got the job done. I think that was a better option and one that uh, I think that uh, Brad Osmus was trying to you know appease his pitcher. But I would have made the decision. I would have pulled him. Well, agree to disagree then. I guess that huh? because you know what he's being paid. 
the big bucks, $20 plus million dollars a year because he's the man, right, with the plan. He has to go out there and get it done every fifth day and throw eight, no, seven, eight innings. And if he only has 90-something pitches going into the ninth, you leave him out there for the ninth because he's been paid the big bucks. So I think you defeated your argument by using that as your reasoning for why you believe he should have been taken out. You know, you really defeated your argument in that sense because I – and I'm playing the devil's advocate. I'm taking the other side of it. And it's that if you have a guy making that much money, you allow him to pitch the ninth inning net. You rely upon him. You trust in him and his arm at only 97, 98 pitches going into the ninth inning. A guy that's a workhorse, has that mentality, wants the ball in his hands in the ninth, and must win situations in a tight game, late inning situations, too, such as on Saturday night against a good team in the Houston Astros. You don't mess around when you're in win-now mode. JV's in win-now mode, and the Tigers are a club in that state as well, wanting to win this season. You can't mess it up by putting in a closer who doesn't throw as hard, who has been good, but he's older, okay, than J.D. JV, I know you don't want to totally ruin him for the future with the big salary he has for future seasons. But you don't worry about that when you're in the win-now mode. That's why I think you defeated your purpose, your argument, by saying that he has more years and much more money on his contract going forward than a Tigers uniform. All right, a player that kind of has earned his way back into the good graces of Tigers fans and in, and earned his way into the good graces of the Doc is Tyler Collins. It's going to be interesting to see what the Tigers do when J.D. Martinez returns, and it seems like his return is ever so close. But what do you think is going to happen with Tyler Collins? Do you think he's going to be the odd man out being sent down when J.D. comes back? And have you forgiven him for that classic all, you know, for that classic middle finger, you know, mistake that he made earlier in the year? <laughs> yeah, he's going to you to everybody in the ballpark, but I'll forgive him because he's in it. If you're producing, I don't care how you are really with your antics, your mannerisms and whatnot. I don't care about all those. Throw that all away to the side because if you hit, if you produce, which if you hit, you do, then I want you on my ball club. So I think he deserves a spot on a 25-man roster right now as a quality fourth outfielder who can get it down with the bat has had a very productive ABs of late getting out in base, even walking if not hitting a home run like he has in clutch big game moments. So I like the guy that is Tyler Collins right now. I like him, his bat, what he provides off the bench. I think he provides a nice spark off that bench for the Tigers. So I would keep him up with the big league ball club. Okay, yeah, I think he's done a good job, and it'll be interesting to see how this is going to shake out with the return of uh, Jordan Zimmerman and J.D. Martinez. Norris is, is slated to come back soon as well at some point this season. It's been a little bit disappointing on that front. But, Vito, it's very interesting right now where we sit. The Tigers are really going to decide, you know, you know, on the phone lines what's going to happen, who they're going to make a move for, how to you know, address this club, and to get them to where they need to go. But it's been a great week. What do you think has contributed to this unbelievable run this week by sweeping Boston and the Houston Astros? Do you give them credit, or is it because of what the Tigers did, or is it you know catching Boston and Houston at a time when they're not playing at their peak level? It's the Tigers, baby. They're mashing at the right time. The little men that can't, right? I mean, they can't. You have him right now coming through. He's coming through big. Tyler Talent, as we just talked about, these under-the-radar performers in their lineup are coming to fruition with their bats. Coming out of nowhere, too, at times, but especially in the clutch moments and the biggest game moments, that means. So I love what they have done, those under-the-radar performers. Iglesias beating out that ground ball for a single to win the game Saturday night for the Tigers. Stuff like that, contributions such as that from the minuscule members of the Tigers lineup. The guys who are under the radar, let's say, they've already used that phrase to describe guys such as Iglesias, Tyler Collins, James McCann, who hasn't hit, really, this season consistently. Has not. Has not even... Not even an argument to be made about that. So, but those guys coming through right now, that's why they're performing as well as they are. And Cabrera really coming to light and stepping out from his slump, you know, hitting in clutch moments now more and more, hitting bombs. It's good to see the power stroke back in Miggy's bat. So it's their bat, it's what they're doing, and obviously it's taking a stroke of luck or two as well for the Tigers. And having that on their side has allowed the Tigers to ride this train of success. And what has now resulted in a six-game winning streak and eight wins in their last ten games, Doc. All right, let's take a quick commercial timeout. I know you got a special guest lined up next. Um, tell everybody who's going to be on the phone line after this quick commercial timeout. Well, we're going to have Mr. Chris Cotillo of MLB Daily Dish of the SB Nation Blog Network. He'll be on with us when we return from this quick commercial break. <laughs> And now, 
joining me on this special pre-MLB trade deadline edition of Tigers Talk. Courtesy see the top cast sales phone line is MLB Daily Dishes, Chris Cotillo. Chris, what's going on? How's it going? Very good, Chris. And first and foremost, to the biggest news of the day for the Cleveland Indians, and really the most relevant news to me regarding the Indians, and not the deal for Andrew Miller, but the refusing of Jonathan Lucroy to waive his no-trade clause to join the Cleveland Indians. Now, when you first found out this news, Chris, how surprised were you to find it out? And also, what was the reason behind his decision to not waive his no-trade clause? Well, honestly, it was shocking. I mean, I think we've all heard Jonathan Lucroy's name a bunch in trade rumors over the last week or so. We've, we've seen a lot of teams in on him, from the Mets to the Rangers to the Indians. And it seemed like yesterday it basically came down to Cleveland and New York. Word broke late last night that Cleveland did, in fact, have a deal in place for him. Usually, I would say 95 98% of the time when there's a deal in place, it usually goes through. But Lucroy obviously had his no-trade clause and could block a deal to Cleveland. And I just thought at that point, you know, here's a guy, Luke Roy, who's publicly gone on the record before saying, I want a deal to a contender. You know, I want to go play for a team that's not Milwaukee, who struggled. And so, therefore, they really thought, you know, he would accept it. Obviously, things didn't work out. The two reasons he didn't accept it were, one, he didn't want – he wanted the Indians to waive his no-trade clause for next year. He's due to make like five and a quarter million, not – Market value, obviously, for a guy who's one of the best catchers in the league. He wanted Cleveland to waive that, let him be a free agent. And number two, they wouldn't promise him the starting catcher's job for next year. Said more of a first-base DH kind of role or kind of sharing time with Jan Gomes once he returned from injury. That was not something Luke Carr was looking to do in his free agent year. So both of those kind of came together and, and made him void the deal, but it looks like he'll be on the move again soon. Who's the favorite now to add Luke Roy, by the way, Chris? I would say Texas. I think I think the Rangers are making a push as we speak. So I, I think they're definitely you know in in the running to get something done by four o'clock on Monday. Now, Chris, this is Tigers talk. So we got to talk about my favorite baseball club in the Detroit Tigers. Winners of six straight, eight of their last ten. Looking like they're going to buy, but what are they going to buy now, Chris? Going into the non waiver deadline on Monday. It's tough. I mean, I think they've been looking at rotation upgrades for sure. You know, they've been talking to the. It raves a little bit about Drew Smiley, which is an interesting candidate, Matt Moore, Chris Archer, Jake Odorizzi, those four guys. They've been talking about a lot of guys. You know, we've seen the names Jeremy Hellickson, Edison Volquez, Hector Santiago, Rasmo Ramirez, another candidate in Tampa I forgot there. So they're looking at those types of guys. They were in on Wade Miley, who got traded just a little bit ago, to the Orioles. I think the problem for the Tigers is a weak farm system. If they don't want to trade Michael Boyd, if they don't want to trade uh, Matt Boyd, excuse me, or, or Michael Fulmer, you know, they, they don't want to move either of those guys, and they don't have payroll flexibility. I think we saw a team today in Baltimore with a weak farm system make a deal for a starter in Wade Miley by taking on a, a large, kind of large contract considering the performance. No cash heading to Baltimore in that deal. They had to give up a triple-A starter, a younger option now for Seattle. We saw another creative move where the Marlins had to deal off their major league roster with Carter Capps and Jared Cozart, plus their top two prospects just to land Andrew Kashner and, and, and Ray. So I, I think it's a tough spot for Detroit to be in for sure. Um, they don't have prospects to move. They don't have payroll flexibility. Um, and that, that really makes it tough, especially in this market for sellers. Chris, you talked about the Tigers dealing for one of the Rays' arms, starting arms, that is, specifically two. Who's the most likely get for the Tigers from the Rays' starting rotation, in your opinion? Seems like Erasmo Ramirez is, is one of the guys they're looking at. You know, I know he's not a starter right now. He's been in the, in the bullpen. He, and it has a lot of versatility, and that's why he's drawing a lot of interest. I know the Baltimore Orioles are in on him as well. They might not be necessarily after the Miley move, but who knows? Teams get creative this time of year. The Dodgers have been on Erasmo as well as basically everybody else with the Rays, whether it's Archer, who they love. Obviously, Andrew Friedman's there. To Steve Pierce, that's a name that really could work. So, if we're talking about the Rays with the Tigers, I think it's, it's a tough one. I think it's really going to be a very high price for the Rays to move any of those guys, especially Archer and Odorizzi, just because they have control. They can move them in the offseason when there's 30 contenders, and it's going to be a weak market then too. So I think the Rays aren't motivated to move those guys unless they get a great offer. I think the more likely teams to make moves for them, for those types of guys, would be the Dodgers or the Rangers. Now you said Matt Boyd's not available. How about Daniel Norris and a deal for the right starting arm? It seems like Norris, I, that's just a name I forgot to mention. I think Norris, Fulmer, and Boyd are completely off the table. Um, and that seems to be a lot of teams are calling, asking for those guys, and Detroit's shown zero willingness to even talk about that. 
what's your bold prediction for the Tigers? What's one move you could see them getting done by the deadline at 4 p.m.? You know, it's 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 tough to gauge. I think I think you know when your GM comes out and says you're going to stand pat, it, it kind of shows that probably shouldn't expect much. You know, obviously you saw last year a very two years in a row very aggressive deadlines on opposite ends of the spectrum. Getting David Price two years ago, sending him and Cespedes out last year, well, Soria. I mean, we're looking at a team now that it might just want to stand pat in a market for sellers, and and I, I really do respect that. I just think. You're seeing these crazy prices getting paid, whether it be, you know, what the Indians had to give up for Miller, what the Indians were offering for Lucroy, what the Cubs had to give up for Chapman is probably the craziest of them all, or even the Marlins, what they had to give up for Kastner. You know, these teams that are selling are getting a lot back. And the Tigers, just after rebuilding the farm just a year ago at the deadline, might not want to do that again. So, what are the chances, truly, of the Tigers making a deal? Over or under 50%? And it sounds like under 50% at this point. Yeah, no, I'd say under probably. I mean, they're definitely in on back end rotation pieces, and if prices fall, especially on some rental guys, you know, it, it could be in play. I just think the guys that they could go up at for rentals, whether it be Rich Hill or Jeremy Hellickson, there's other teams that are going to be more aggressive than them and have some more pieces to move. Now, who's the biggest piece you see being dealt that by the deadline? Biggest in, in name from any league. major league ball club. From any, yeah, yeah any I mean, major league ball club. I mean, I would say you're looking at the two guys that we've been looking at for for weeks. I think it's Jay Bruce and Jonathan Lucroy are the surest bets to go. I think Lucroy's probably going to get traded. As I said, the Rangers look like the favorite. The Dodgers look like the favorite for Bruce, but there's like six to eight teams in there. You never know where that's going to turn out. I think both of those guys are likely to go. On the starters front, you know, we, we've seen the biggest starter to get moved so far has been Kashner. And it's starting to see a couple names come off the board, Wade Miley, and then a lot of bullpen guys, obviously, and Chapman and Miller. And Melanson, but I think for the guys that are left, it's not the sexiest market this year by any means. And I think if we're looking at relievers being the biggest names moved, as good as Miller and Chapman are, they're still relievers. And at the end of the day, you know, have limited impact and compared to a starter or some position players. I think we're really looking at Bruce or Lucroy. But on this market, if a team is really motivated to deal a Chris Archer if you're Tampa Bay, or if you're motivated to deal Chris Taylor or Jose Quintana if you're the White Sox, we could see those, see those getting done as well. What are the chances that a sale being dealt and then also Chris Archer over or under 50% for those two guys? Way under on both, I think. Um, I really don't see sale getting moved unless they're just blown away by a package. The only wild card in this, I really think, and I think I say this now because I think the Rangers, again, are on Luke Roy. I think the Dodgers are a wild card on both of those guys. They're willing to offer Julio Urias a plus for a guy like Archer, a guy like Sale. I think those teams have to consider it. I don't know if you're going to get a better haul. They've obviously had so many pitching injuries. You don't know what's going on with Clayton Kershaw. Hyunjin Ryu's been hurt. Alex Wood, Brandon McCarthy just came back. Brett Anderson's been out today. Bud Norris, their only starting addition so far, goes down. I think they could get desperate, look to make a move. And that could be for Archer still. I think the Dodgers are a really interesting wild card. Not to mention the Red Sox. You you guys know better than anyone about Dave Dombrowski and his, his ways of being Dylan Dave. So I think they could make an aggressive move as well. They just don't want to part with Andrew Benatende, Yohan Moncada, or Mookie Betts, Xander Bogarts, or Jackie Bradley, kind of their core guys. And so I don't think I don't think they're going to be able to get anything done without those guys moving. But we'll see. There's still some time before the deadline. Crazy things happen on, the, on deadline day. Chris, thank you very much for all the time, and best of luck the rest of the way. Thank you for having me. And that was Chris Cotillo of SB Nation's MLB blog, MLB Daily Dish. Follow him on Twitter for all. Your breaking news leading up to the non waiver trade deadline day at 4 p.m. Got great stuff, insight from him, and he always brings it on Twitter. All the trade rumors, always breaking it down, giving us the inside scoop via Twitter. Appreciated that. Appreciated what you have brought to the table today, and what also Jordan Hall of the podcast, the Yano's Pot, brought to this special edition, trade deadline edition of the podcast. Yeah, no, great stuff. I'm appreciative of you and your passion for baseball. Um, Before we get out of here, other clubs have improved their teams, obviously the Cubs, the Indians. Are you hearing any other big trade rumors that are likely to go down, or are you hearing some uh, other rumors of some additions that some clubs could make? I'm thinking right now, from what I've heard, Luke Roy might end up with the Rangers, a big bat there to add for the Rangers. Uh, Jay Bruce, still widely available on the market. I don't know where he's going yet, maybe to the Mets. Maybe to the Giants, both those teams needed a spark of offense. So Bruce would provide that he's had a great season up to this point for the Reds, who are big-time sellers in Cincinnati this year. So could be him being dealt, 
could see Lou Croy still being dealt. Two teams such as the Rangers and the Dodgers are willing to make a move to upgrade their rotation. Kershaw could be out for the rest of the season. So there could be a move made there. But Norris just got hurt. So, I mean, two guys right there for the rotation being hurt. If that's what they're going to do pre or go on into the trade deadline. So I could see them making a move for a big-time starting arm. Maybe for sale, that means. And I've heard they have been a candidate to make that move to get Chris Sale from the White Sox, which would take a lot. I've heard five prospects, and five middle to top tier prospects, probably three top tier, two middle tier. So it will take a lot from the Dodgers' farm system, but they have that great hoop of farm system players, top prospects in their organization as a whole, to pull off that deal for Chris Sale and the White Sox. Now, Vito, before we get out of here and wrap up on this special Tiger Talk edition, going over some Major League Baseball trade deadline news and notes, and especially what's going on with the Tigers, what does Vito do around this time? What sites do you check out? What are the best sites to kind of peek in to, to be in the know regarding the MLB trade deadline? What websites do you go to? What site should the doc check out to be in the know and to be as smart as Vito? Well, doc, obviously check out... Chris Cotillo at MLB Daily Dish with the SB Nation Blog Network once again. Also, the free press, come on, you got to know all that. And also, MLB Trade Rumors, and a great hub for all things trade rumors leading up to the trade deadline. I love that site and the work they do day in, day out leading up to the trade deadline. Should be some great rumors circulating on their website and breaking uh, moves, you know, breaking news about trades going down up until that deadline. So those are the sites to watch, to really, to really check out now leading up to that deadline, Doc, in my opinion. All right, Vito, good stuff. Thank you again. I know that you're a very passionate baseball guy. Thank you for pushing me to do this. It was very fun. Um, I, I love the fact that, hey, we can just hang out and take phone calls and get a couple guests on at the same time. You can record. Hey, despite the fact you kept pushing the button, it was very enjoyable. I had a good time. And hopefully the, the when this comes out, a lot of buzz will be happening with what the hell the Tigers are doing. Yeah, hopefully a move. At least a move is made for the Tigers. We will see exciting times. And, Doc, with that, thank you very much for joining me on this special edition of Tigers Talk, leading up to the non-waiver trade deadline. Yeah, and I want to thank all the sponsors that sponsor the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Without them, we couldn't have a phone line system. Without them, we wouldn't be able to put on daily podcasts for the great fans of the city of Detroit. And we want to thank especially Top Cat Sales for sponsoring the phone lines. All guests appear courtesy of the Top Cat Sales phone lines. Thank you to Vito. Thank you to Chris Cotillo. Thank you to Jordan Hall. Thank you to everybody that downloads this fine project and every episode on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. See ya.